So I think it's uh, one two. I think it's time we got underway. Thank you everyone for joining us today, where we're going to have a, a really good chat, I hope, about uh, digital journalism, how you can pivot your career to become more digital. And I hope it really appeals to people across uh, the journalism divide, whether people are already in digital roles, whether they're in print only roles, or probably more likely somewhere in the middle. Um, this is the first one of these I've chaired, so um, it should be fun. We're going to have around 40, 45 minutes of panel chat, and then afterwards we're going to make sure we leave enough time to do a Q&A. So do feel free to ask questions in the chat. I think everyone's muted, so it'll have to be via chat. We will pick those up. Maybe as we go along, we'll probably more likely we'll save a bit of time at the end. Um, and the chat is really made possible by these uh, brilliant people who we've joined together today. I'm going to quickly introduce them. They are from across the UK. Um, if you're wondering who I am, I'm Tim Pollard. I'm the Digital Editorial Director at Bauer Media. I've uh, been a motoring journalist for 23 years, so my background is writing about cars. But I've broadened out now and I sort of um, help uh, run all the websites and manage all the edit web editors at Bauer. So that's me. Um, and I'm joined by uh, Deborah Joseph, who's the Editor-in-Chief of Glamour UK at Condé Nast in London. Um, also, Sarah Brown, who's the head of Northern Europe News Partnerships at Facebook, also in London. And Chris Finn, who's head of podcasts at DC Thompson Media up in Dundee. Uh, I'm based in Peterborough, so we really are across the UK. And I'm just like to go to um, the team very briefly and allow them a chance to sort of explain a little bit more about what they do. Um, and maybe, Deborah, if we start with you. Now, you really have pivoted um, very heavily from print to digital. Uh, you, you've worked at Cosmo, More, Daily Mail, Women's Lifestyle Section, Brides, Easy Living, you've done it all. But uh, you told me before this, you could see the shift in the industry. So tell me a little bit about how you ended up in your role and working predominantly in digital now. Um, well, hi, Tim, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, I, I, I traditionally I was a print journalist and then a print editor. As you said, I've worked in all of those places, Cosmo, Moore, Daily Mail. I've spent the majority of my career at Condé Nast on various different print titles. And about eight or nine years ago, I was made editor of Easy Living, which is a now defunct print magazine. And while, uh, while I was the editor there, I'd only been the editor for a year and a half and they closed the title down. I was actually on maternity leave at the time when it closed. And it was, it was just an aha moment where I'd seen a lot of the advertising revenue be taken out of the print and put into digital. And when I was made redundant and, you know, redundancy as, much, as difficult it is in a lot of situations, it's also a real moment to rethink your career and to pivot. And I decided at that point that I was going to move away from print and journalism and move into um, an online space. And I was very, very lucky that I got offered a job working for an app as a head of content for a, an entertainment app. This is about, I don't know, a month after I'd got made redundant. So I completely went from the glamorous, glossy world of, of Condé Nast to working with a very small startup in, you know, a small office in Camden and sitting with the tech team and learning, you know, it was like learning Japanese. I didn't understand what anybody was saying. I was sitting in the meetings thinking, oh God, I'm going to get found out. I don't know what I'm doing here. And I used to go and hide in the toilets and bring my brother, who was a coder at the time, and go, what does open source mean? What's iOS? I literally did not know a single thing. But within six to eight months, I started understanding all the language. I understood how to do a social media campaigns, how to use the CMS, which is the back end of a website. And I just started to, to learn the ways of digital. And I realized very quickly, it's just not the dark arts at all. You know, there's so much fear around it. Um, especially for print journalists who've been used to doing it for maybe sometimes 20, 30 years. It's not the dark arts and our skills are very transferable to digital. And I really, really loved it. And I did, I worked in startups for five years nearly. And then when Condé Nast decided to move Glamour from a print magazine to a digital first magazine, um, it was to my benefit in the sense that I'd had the digital experience, but I also had the print experience. Mm -hmm. So I was brought on to both edit just two issues a year of, of print, but also to oversee all the social media and the website and all the online events that we do. And so now I've got a, a hybrid career of print and digital. And that's yeah, that. which is, I love, you know, that sort of all the jargon. There's so much jargon in digital. Oh, like, in all sorts of walks of life professionally, you come across yeah. it. There's a lot of jargon. And yet, ultimately, you know, we, we're all journalists at heart who've sort of flipped over and become more digital. Anyone can do it. And I think this will really, hopefully, will tease that out um, in the session this afternoon. And maybe we can turn to Chris, um, head of podcast at DC Thompson Media. Now, you, Chris, have had a really interesting career. Again, you started in print, you've edited 
Apple Mac magazines, you've worked at Future, Dennis, you've been a lecturer in journalism. How on earth did you end up becoming uh, head of podcasting at DC Thompson Media? Uh, yes, I'm very much not a straight line career path by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I graduated with a graphic design degree and in the summer after I graduated my university, I um, happened to see a job opening in one of the magazines I liked and read and applied for that job and that has been my career <laughs> ever since with no particular decision in that um, in driving that sort of career path um, and as you say working in largely in print although we also did some really interesting work in uh, iPad publishing when that first started remember when iPads were going to say publishing what heady days those were um, but then uh, as my role here at DC Thompson changed um, and I was set to be cast adrift from the company, had some conversations with our chief exec, and we knew that we wanted to move into this space, into podcasting, and so since the start of 2019, um, I've had the very, uh, the great privilege of leading that challenge, and it's a privilege not just because it's a terrific and fun, exciting and rewarding job, but because, um, and especially to any uh, younger journalists watching, um, this was the first time in my life, and I'm 40 years old now, where I had taken a proactive step in my career. I'd gone to my chief exec and said, I think we should be doing podcasting. And he, he, he'd also been having these conversations anyway. Like, yeah, absolutely, we want to do that. Um, but it was the first time I'd ever gone, here's a thing I want to do. Can I please do it? Um, and so I'm incredibly fortunate that I had a, a ready audience in my to hear that and to give me the space to, to create and we've now got 11 shows in our folio um, but also uh, I think worth noting that this was the, the first the first pure, pure digital role I've ever done but also the first role in which I had proactively said I am I can identify a thing I want to do and then go and do it rather than just sort of stumbling from things. That thing. kind of managing upwards is very important isn't it and I think it's a great thing that all of us can take away from this you know uh, if you've got an idea go and go, go and punt it upwards to your managers and the people at the top of the business because I think it's moving so fast at the moment and there is opportunity galore and somebody our, our fourth uh, panelist uh, who I'd like to sort of introduce in a bit more detail now has done exactly that as well so um, Sarah you obviously work now at Facebook um, social media is almost you can't extract social media from digital when we talk about a digital media sort of session we wanted to have um, you know one of the big um, social companies present and I think having Facebook here is brilliant because all publishers work with Facebook Tell us a bit about your background, because you have also, you were a journalist, you've worked at the very, you know, the sharp end, BBC News, Al Jazeera, CNN. Tell us a bit about how you ended up in the sort of news partnership department at Facebook. Absolutely. And, and you know, listening to, to Chris and to Deborah, I mean, I think it's just proof that we have what we, I think is terms, the technical terms, wiggly careers. Um, you know, I started off, you know, back in, <clears throat> won't tell you exactly what year, um, <laughs> you know as a business publisher um you know in a very small magazine a b2b magazine um and then moved to the bbc uh, i will reveal my age now because I, I joined the bbc a few weeks after september the 11th and uh, it was an extraordinary baptism of fire for a very young journalist who was having to then grapple with these incredibly difficult issues in addition to as deborah points out thinking about this whole technical and digital space and not only how we create stories but also how we get them out there and disseminate them to people so it was an extraordinary baptism of fire um, but I think it was, you know, an incredibly, you know, interesting one in terms of my career. Um, so, you know, I started off the BBC, was there for five years. And when I was there, I, I worked in a place called the UGC Hub, the User Generated Content Hub. Now, this is before social media had entered the landscape. But it was when we were starting to realise the power of, of, of user generated or people generated, really, content and stories from a platform. You know, people who are in their communities are the experts and they can really tell you what's happening. And I just became really interested in the space of how we could work with people in communities across the world to tell the stories that mattered to them. So I did this specifically for the Middle East for two years. It was a region that I didn't know a huge amount about, but got to know very well. And then of course that led to me um, going out to Qatar in 2006 to join Al Jazeera, um, where I spent two years. And, you know, an extraordinary experience, obviously not just living in a different um, country, although I'd lived in America and studied there for a long time, 
um, but also just to kind of grapple with a different method of storytelling, working with different languages, working with different experiences and environments. Um, and also, again, in a broadcast environment, I've always worked in the kind of digital component of broadcasting. Um, but I then did, as, as, as Chris pointed out, I then did a kind of pivot. I actually went to nonprofits for a few years. I was deputy chief executive of a women's organization in the UK, um, something that I just felt passionate about and wanted to do. And, and actually extraordinary in terms of um, empowering women's organizations again to tell their stories so they could harness the power of media and social media in particular. I, I got funding to do a three year course um, training women's organizations and how to effectively use social media for lobbying and advocacy, which was you know extraordinary. We got some great results from it. Um, but I miss journalism, uh, as I'm sure everyone in this call would, would feel the same. I miss, I miss telling stories, I miss talking to people, I miss the buzz of putting a phone down after an interview. Um, and then five minutes later, realizing I'd forgotten to ask them about seven different things and having to call them back. Um, but, you know, I missed that. And so I joined CNN in 2012. Um, and, you know, CNN at the time were going through a big digital transformation. And then the story I was telling, um, you know, telling um, someone from the panel earlier was that I, um, when I joined CNN, I was in the morning meeting, I was the last person to be called on before we kind of closed the meeting for the day. And by three years later, when I left to join Facebook, I was the first person called on in the meeting every day. And, you know, while I give myself obviously 99% of the credit for, you know, helping to shift to a more kind of social and digital first storytelling format, it also was just the times. Um, you know, people were really looking about what was important in terms of what people were discussing on social media. Um, and my pivot also, not dissimilar to Deborah, my pivot came on maternity leave. Um, I just had my daughter and in between, you know, feeding and, you know, trying to keep a, you know, nine month old baby entertained, I was thinking about my next move. And when, you know, my former manager who had moved to um, Facebook posted a job, I pinged in through LinkedIn and sort of said, hi, sounds interesting. Can we have a coffee? Um, and two months later, I was there and I've been there for six years and I've, you know, obviously seen an enormous transformation in the news industry. Um, enormous transformation within Facebook. We're a lot bigger. I've now been there longer than 88% of the company, I believe, which is extraordinary in terms of our growth. But I think one thing has stayed constant, which I think is, is the, the importance of really good storytelling, the importance of, you know, getting news out there to people that it matters the most to. And that, I think, has never changed um, in the years that I've worked at Facebook and the years that I've worked in media. Maybe just sticking with you, Sarah, I think it's absolutely fascinating that I know in digital, most publishers in the UK, we, we are very focused clearly on our on our own platforms. And yet everyone, I think, on this call would understand and um, get the idea. We work, we want to work with the, the social media you know, companies as well. The platforms that you guys have the reach is enormous, new audiences, new ways to tell, you know, of storytelling. But how do the best publishers in the magazine space, how do the best ones work with you? Can you give us some examples of um, you know, best practice and what people on this call may be going, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe we should be thinking of these new tools or services that you guys are doing. Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing to think about is is is, is your capacity. Like, what do you have resource wise that you want to, to, that you have that you can draw on to tell to tell the stories that matter the most to you? And the second thing is doing your due diligence. You know, how which audiences do you want to reach? You can do the kind of spray and pray approach where you literally just try everything and see what works. But if you actually do a little bit of research and think about, you know, what audiences in terms of age, in terms of demographics, in terms of types of stories, you know, what seems to work or seems to resonate whenever we put them out there. And thinking about how you can engage with those and where those audiences seem to be can really, really powerful tool in terms of how you can think about your storytelling. And so, you know, what I often say to people is, you know, I am mindful of journalists, especially nowadays, you don't have a lot of time, you've got a lot of things to do. Um, so sometimes it can be a case of pick one thing and do it well. Um, if you work for a large organization, you have the, you know, you have big teams, you have resources that you can try different things and different platforms, great. If not, pick one thing and be mindful that what works on one might not work on the other. What works on Instagram doesn't work on Facebook, doesn't work on YouTube, doesn't work on Twitter, doesn't work on Snapchat, doesn't work on TikTok, doesn't work on insert any other myriad of social platforms there. Um, so thinking about how you nuance the content you're putting on that platform and thinking about which one you actually really think you could make a good go of um, would be great. I mean, a good example is we, we held an Instagram accelerator earlier this year where we worked with around 10, 15 publishers from the UK and the Nordics, um, train them on video content, train them on using Instagram, thinking about storytelling engagement, driving newsletter subscriptions, driving traffic, um, and just, you know, getting them to be able to feel confident when they use the platform better. And uh, we have welcomed Vogue, um, came to the accelerator, 
and as a result saw an increase in impressions on their story and an increase in the reach towards their audience, um, which obviously for them is fantastic because then you have new people you can convert to long time readers, long time um, potentially subscribers as well. So I think that's a case of like being that laser focus, picking that one thing and going, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to have a go at it. And the other thing I, you know, I was saying before is if you've got a team and you've got someone in your team who's really keen to take on a challenge, harness that enthusiasm, um, give it to them, give it to them and get them to go and run with it. I mean, that's what happened to me when I was a younger journalist. I was given projects like that and I was, you know, enthusiastic and still am obviously just a little bit older. Um, I would take it and run with it. It gave me great skills. It gave me great visibility, but also for the company, it gave them a great piece of work that they can then scale out internally to the rest of their organization. I tell you, I, I totally second that. We see that in our teams. The best, the best things we do at Bauer are when there's real ownership. And I think, you know, there's so many channels now we're on. I, I would echo what you say, Sarah, about rather than trying to do everything, we, we try and go, well, hang on, we've really, we've really got a strategy. We know why we're on this social platform and we're going to use it for this reason. So we've got to be focused about it. And that ability also to say no sometimes. And we go, actually, we can't do everything. Let's do things well instead. So I can really, really identify that. Can we maybe flip over to Deborah? So, you know, we were talking about when you made the shift and, you know, you had all this new the jargon, the lingo. But I'm really interested in this about how, how you learn the new skills. How do you keep up? So I think even, you know, you and I are now, you know, very, very you know, immersed in digital all the time. And yeah, it's really hard. You've got to keep up. It's, it's changing every single uh, month, really, you know, whether it's Google algorithms or whatever. But how do you generally keep up to, up to speed with everything, Deborah? Well, I don't, I don't, when people say to me, oh, I'm a digital, they're a digital expert, I don't believe them because you're an expert one week and the next week, absolutely everything changes. The Google algorithm changes, the Facebook algorithm changes, you know, Instagram adds a new, something new to it and you have to learn everything again. So I think the whole, I think certainly at Glamour, what we've done is we're always open-minded to learning and bringing on new things. And I'm really, my team are brilliant. So I hire very cleverly and bring people on who've got those, those skills. So I've got a social media editor who's always on top of the digital tools around social media, for example, and she trains us up, or we've got an SEO manager who's currently training us up on the new SEO and Google changes. We just constantly have experts in the team who train everybody else up. Um, I do editing training at lunchtime. Sorry, that's my children screaming in the background. I apologize. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really surrounding yourself with experts. Obviously, also, we have centralized um, teams at Condé Nast who train us as well. Um, and it's just being curious, you know, be curious, be first to new platforms, um, anything that new that comes on. Don't be afraid to try it out personally on your own Instagram, your own Facebook. Um, don't be afraid of failing. We try things all the time at Glamour. We move quickly, we pivot, um, we're agile. Things sometimes don't work. And I'm, I would say to the team, it doesn't matter if it fails. If it's a new platform, just try it, see what works, experiment. So that's really how we work, experiment and learn. And if it doesn't work, don't do it. And if it does work, do it again. And that's really that's really how I learn. It's, it's, it's that kind of open, mind error. It's that open mindset, isn't it? I think, um, I think digital media, digital journalism, you've got to be so collaborative because when I think what, you know, what I can do when I was working in print, you know, we, we had a certain number of pages, empty canvas, and we were in control of our own destiny. Whereas I always say to the teams at Bauer that, you know, you've got to go and collaborate with these people. We've got an SEO team. You know, if you've got pockets of expertise in your business, you know, go and get to know them. They are your friends. You know, we need to help work with those people. So I think I agree, you know, no one person can really be expected to know all of this at all. So lean on your colleagues, you know, work out where the expertise is. And maybe just one follow-up point, Deborah. Um, we, we spoke didn't we, a few a couple of weeks ago now, but we were talking about the, and you know, it's good that it's good we're tackling quite difficult things there, but there's, there's still a bit of a perceived snobbery in some parts of um, publishing companies, isn't there? About, oh, that's the digital part. How, how do you see that? Do you think, do you sort of recognise that a little bit? And how can, how can people counter that? I think it's changing, but I definitely think there is a snobbery or there has been rather a snobbery. I, I, I certainly know when Glamour went digital first, people just were like, oh, Glamour's over. It's finished. If you're not in print, then you're over. It's finished, which is over time has proved not to be true, especially in this pandemic when I think the whole world has moved to a more digital space. Um, but I think one of the reasons is the conversation around journalism and journalism. When you're having to produce so many pieces of content so quickly and upload them onto your social media, onto your website, being able to craft 
a piece of journalism it's not as easy so when in print we might you know someone might take three days to write something and then it goes through three edits before it even makes it to the sub and on our website sometimes it's like quickly you write it someone will check it over and it's up on the site within five minutes so you just don't have the time to craft so that's why I think training is important making sure that all journalists have proper training rather than just hiring a young journalist just throwing them onto working on a website and not teaching them just the basics of, of journalism um, but I do think that snobbery is it, I think certainly the pandemic has changed the snobbery because a lot of the brands for example that were only interested in print now have realized that online sales are key so they're really encouraging more online journalism online PR support and the conversation is changing and I, I, I honestly believe this anybody who thinks that you know, digital journalism is not the future. I, 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 I don't agree with that. I really no. strongly don't agree with it. And the numbers, you know, the numbers are there for all to see. We all, you know, I, I imagine most people on the call, the digital branches probably have a higher reach, you know, greater, greater eyeballs than, um, than the print, you know, which is typically the case for most publishers. And well, the Vietnamese I've got journalist. Eyeballs, yeah, greater, but also you know exactly how many people have read a particular article. You can't offer that in print. You don't know who is reading exactly what article in a print magazine. Whereas we, you know, we upload an article, we know within a couple of hours how many people are on it reading at any one time. So it's very powerful having the data behind the content. And to me, knowing that data and using it to improve your content is a really a strong point. I know, and I've yet to meet a journalist who doesn't like their, their stories uh, being being read or consumed. So uh, <laughs> definitely agree with that. Let's flip over to Chris. Now, I'm actually also, I've just, um, I think, you know, halfway through, in case anyone's um, just joining us uh, and, and missed the introductions at the beginning, Chris is the head of podcasting at DC Thompson Media up in Dundee. We've got Sarah um, Brown, who's head of Northern Europe News Partnerships at Facebook, and uh, Deborah Joseph, who's the editor-in-chief of Glamour UK. So lots of digital expertise here. Thank you guys for joining us again. But let's pop over to Chris. So I love the line you said to me, you know, we were working out why, why you've now, you know, you've ended up after a, a you know, a career in, in, in magazines and journalism generally, and you're now in charge of podcasting. You, you used a wonderful line to me where you said, it's just all about the storytelling. It doesn't matter about the format. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I think everyone here, whether it's uh, telling stories on a social platform or on digital or, or in printed magazines or, or indeed on podcasting, it's all ultimately about storytelling, isn't it? Does that underpin your kind of view of digital journalism? Of course, and absolutely. And it, it, it's almost a trite thing to say, right? It's almost a, a thing that we, we, we kind of acknowledge and immediately move on from because it's such a, a basic and fundamental underpinning part any form of journalism is a storytelling. It's, it's, it's especially true in magazine journalism, I would submit, um, than in news journalism, but it's true for any journalism you do. And the, the challenge is always uh, understanding the best bits of each medium that you're working with and understand why it's important, why it matters, where it's consumed, when it's consumed, what it means to people when they consume it. And I'll absolutely 100% echo both Sarah and Deborah. Sarah saying, you know, find those people in your organization and empower them and enfranchise them to, to go ahead and, and lead and, and tell you um, what you should be doing if you're an editor and find those. And it doesn't have to be young people, like, you know, let's not be ages about this, but those people with a, 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 with a, a, a passion and a, and a hunger for something. So if you've got somebody who, you know, is constantly sitting there on their phone they might be there on TikTok or on Snapchat or something, and, and there might be something you can take from them to, to, to bring into your organization. And to Deborah's point, she says, surround yourself with, with an expert 100%, but don't think an expert is a hundred grand a year uh, management consultant you bring in to train you for a day or two here and there. Your experts are, we all know how embarrassing it is, or we should all know how embarrassing it is when. Um, somebody who's not a fully digital native person or who feels comfortable in a native uh, digital world comes into that world and tries to use Twitter, for example, as a as a broadcast medium, as a we're just going to you know RSS or headlines it onto Twitter, or they come in and they they just post 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 to Insta stories and they never interact with people or amplify people. We all understand how awkward those those places can be and those those um, experiences can be but the people who are swimming in those waters who are living and breathing it those are your experts and those are the people to empower and enfranchise and learn from as much as you're, you're teaching them and I think to Deborah's point again training is incredibly important 
But what there it is very easy, I would submit, and I spent my whole career in print up until now, so I'm not denigrating print, but it's very easy for people from a print background to impose a, a sort of ossified version of journalism onto digital journalists. And so, and I was guilty myself, with myself as an editor in chief for a group of titles, you know, trying to make us do things in a way that made sense in print in a digital environment is, is obviously wrong, uh, objectively wrong, but it's hard to see it at the time. It's hard to see those conversations about it has to go through a sub and a prod and, you know, it has to go through this, this quality control thing. Um, like my wife, who's far better Instagram stories than I am, um, she gets really annoyed when I'm like really prissy with like my typography and layout and making it look really nice. Whereas part of the language of Instagram stories in particular is a certain anti-aesthetic aesthetic, right? And when you try to impose a, a, a print mindset, a, a high quality glossy print mindset on that, it can sometimes I think feel a little bit uh, a little bit awkward. But to your point, sorry, I just need, I'm telling a story. Storytelling, of course, those uh, that underpins everything we should do in any medium we're in, any touch point we have with our audiences, whether it's email newsletters, a social channel, a print title, um, a, an event, anything is all about storytelling, and and it's creating that point of coalescence for passion for people to you know people to to, to gather around something. But we have to understand what each bit does and how they all fit together, and how each can support the other as well. And um, so when, you know, thinking of a panel, we've got, you know, 100 people on this call. Um, how, if, if people are there thinking, oh, you know, 2021 is for year, I've, I've got this idea for a podcast. Can you give a very brief truncated, but, you know, give us an essence, a flavour for how people should approach it. What, what, what makes brilliant podcasting in the magazine sort of space in which, you know, that's the context in which we're here today. Can you give, is it possible to answer that quite sort of brief and give us a sort of flavour? Absolutely. I mean, I can answer it briefly at a very sort of top level, at a kind of abstract level, and it's sometimes these kind of answers can be quite irritating because actually what you want to hear is make it 32 minutes long, have three people on it, buy this microphone, I think that's what you want to hear. But <laughs> at the kind of abstract level, the, the, the thing that makes a good podcast is one that respects its audience. Um, and that's, that's essentially it. it. You shouldn't necessarily make podcasts that um, are a direct reification of another part of your brand a print magazine most often for this group here, I'd suspect. So don't you have to, um, you know, in, in some way replicate your brand in terms of the content of the way it's produced. But what you absolutely have to do, must do, is replicate that brand, those brand values and that brand experience and that brand tone. Um, and so it might be that you end up, so, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that, that somebody in my position might have in, in publishing companies up and down the UK and across the world with magazine people is, you know, how do we take the stories we're doing in the magazine and turn them into a podcast? But I submit that's the wrong way right, to think about it. If you think instead about, um, you know, what podcasting can do brilliantly, which is, you know, intimacy, depth, personality, you know, uh, uh, dwell times that video editors can only dream of, you know, that kind of deep hold that you can have with people think about what those things do well and think about where those fit into what your uh, brand uh, does just now it's very easy to think about a podcast as being an interview based podcast uh, you know uh, bringing people from your team and going and to go and interview you know, business leaders or, or, or people from your industry and that's valid and there's countless examples of those but there might be you know fun little ways of doing things Get, let me give you one really quick example this isn't intended to be an example that is actionable. I'm not suggesting people actually go out and make a podcast like this, but it's my go-to example to get you thinking a little bit better about this. There is a podcast that uh, is published by um, Gimlet Media. It's called Chompers and it comes out twice a day. It is published in the morning and in the evening and each episode is two minutes long. And even from, so from the, the people watching this, you can use a chat function or even from the panel, uh, the, my three esteemed colleagues, can you think what that podcast is for? Yeah, I'll give you 30, I'll give you 10 seconds to think what that podcast might be for. Twice a day, morning, evening, two minutes long. It's for brushing your teeth. And so the idea is that it's an Alexa skill, really, that uh, parents will get their kids to trigger that lasts for two minutes while the kids brush their teeth properly. And it's like funny facts and stories and interesting stuff to do. And that's a really good example. If you're doing a, you know, a dentist association B2B magazine or something, Something like that's a really interesting way of not replicating your content, but you know, using the medium to do some really interesting things. 
Is it Matt? A lovely example. Lovely example, Chris. And I feel I feel really dense for sort of not not chipping in with. I don't know. I was thinking, what is it? A morning news briefing and an evening one. I don't know. But that's a lovely, lovely. It's a two minutes thing. That's key. And and what a great way to, I suppose, illustrate how you know you shouldn't just try and do traditional, force traditional shape things into into new shapes. And maybe Sarah, let's return to Absolutely. you. Talk about, talk about Facebook. Because I think in the early days, thinking back, you know. I suppose uh, well, a decade ago, really, when you know when we first started using it, anyway, you know, it was very much link sharing and like, well, they'll come back and you know read the, the story on our website. But the game's moved on now. I mean, are you able to give us a flavour of? Um, uh, and Chris sort of mentioned this. It's got. To, we all know that in in most publishing companies, certainly the sort of big, um, you know, corporates, maybe less, and the indies, we all need to be able to do stuff that's monetizable and has a commercial purpose. Can you give us a flavour for, you know, your advice to people on the call, maybe who may be thinking, well, you know, social media, we're out there, we're engaging, but, you know, how can we monetize? Huge question, but can you just give us a little snapshot into your thinking about how, how publishers can profitably, you know, do this in a way that's going to really support their commercial goals? Because that's clearly a, an important uh, task for editors. Absolutely. And, and I mean, a lot of it boils down to, funnily enough, I was just, I was just laughing at the chat. I just love that someone's just said that Deborah's um, sequence are fantastic. And I 100% agree. Um, and that's kind of what that's what social platforms are about. We're about connectivity, but we're also in real time. Um, someone's just saying I knew we should have worn mine, <laughs> Chris. Um, but you know, it's it's about that real time connectivity um, that we that we offer. And I think you know, going back to your previous question, the people who use our platforms the best are the ones who acknowledge that that is a very important part of it. And you you know, you, you shouldn't think of our platforms as just we put it on there and, and behold, it'll just go out there and find its audience. Um, you have to think about how to do that. Um, so, you know, a couple of things, you know, even just since I've joined Facebook, I mean, when I joined back in 2015, there weren't really ways to monetize your content at all. Um, so now we have, obviously, uh, you can now insert ad breaks in your video content and make money from that. You can use instant articles and make money from it. You can use branded content, which for a lot of people in this call will be important because the fantastic deals that I'm sure you'll be making with brands um, you know, obviously can, you can do that with ourselves as well. Um, we will be uh, very soon launching Facebook News in the UK, which is an entire surface for news content on the Facebook app. Um, and when I say news, I don't just mean hard news. I mean, it's important to know that it will be a space for all different types of news, including lifestyle content, etc. And that was very much based on feedback from, from publishers and from users that they wanted a dedicated space for such content, not just in newsfeed. So there are more ways than ever, you know, on our platform to, 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 to monetize, to develop your business, to reach new audiences but really it kind of again boils down to what your approach will be um so i think somebody mentioned in in the comment in the chat i've been cheating and looking at the questions early sorry um, typical tech person looking early but you know a, a very good question came up about how you measure these things and, and and one is we have a tool called crowdtangle for example crowdtangle is a real-time discovery and uh, content assessment tool that you can use and, and within your organizations um, most of them will have access I would hope um, and this allows you both to kind of benchmark your performance against your competitors it also enables you to, to find new content um, or news gather interesting content you can look at things that are overperforming um, that you've published in the past you know few months and that can give you a really good sense of, of trends and what people are coming to you for so I think kind of you know if you have the monetization piece, but you're getting the audience development piece right, you're getting the audience engagement piece right, the two can come together and do something very powerful. And, you know, we've seen this, you know, with, with a lot of our kind of, you know, publishing teams from publishers, both in the UK and, and in the US and abroad. Um, they've been smart, they've looked at how their content has performed and they've been able to monetize as a result. Yeah, and uh, as Sarah was telling me, there's all sorts of training available for, you know, the Facebook, um, group of companies and Instagram, you know, it's yes. worth having a look at that, isn't it? And, and I think it's really important, again, someone was, was mentioning in chat and, uh, you know, I think important very for freelancers who are probably on this call, um, where you don't necessarily have access to the training that a large organization would have. But I think also for people who are thinking of pivoting or also just kind of developing a multidisciplinary kind of range of skills, our facebookjournalismproject.com website has training courses for journalists on every aspect of our platform. Um, you know, how to use Facebook Live, how to use instant articles, uh, safety on our platform, um, how to make sure that you can kind of protect yourself on, on our platform, using Instagram for storytelling. I mean, there's, there's, there's literally everything and they are free. Um, they also have, uh, we have a whole course that you can get a certificate for, which we did in partnership with Pointer in the US, which again has all these different things. 
um, has a great course on Facebook groups. Um, I think particularly if you're freelancing or you're looking for content every day and, you know, looking to engage with audiences, Facebook groups are a fantastic way to do so. So please do, you know, investigate these afterwards and I'm happy to ping along um, some links for, to share as well. We should make sure we do that through the, uh, the BSME newsletter and, and, and website, I think, because I, I, for one, would love to do that. And I think, uh, Deborah, in fact, everyone's touched on this. You know, this is not uh, an area to work in if you just want to be, well, I, I know what's best and I'm going to carry on doing it this way. This is a, an area where, you know, if you are open and like a sponge for learning and, and, and adapting and, you know, picking up new tricks, I think digital media is brilliant at that. And I, it's one of the things that keeps me fresh and stimulated, I think, really. Uh, I love that about it. We've, we've been talking about monetization has kind of crept in. You know, I guess this, this call is aimed at sort of people at editor and, you know, sort of section editor level. So we all understand the need to be able to create content, great content, that we, stuff that we can monetize. Deborah, we've spoken before about, you know, I think your, your websites and indeed some of ours. In fact, everyone, you know, I'm sure yours as well, Chris, but, you know, we, we have a lot of services and affiliate deals and stuff. How do, you, how do you approach that, the sort of blend between pure editorial, you know, there's great storytelling because we know this is what the audience wants to know, with creating content that might sell products. How do you how do you treat that on your titles, Deborah? Well, firstly, it's interesting because when, when Glamour pivoted to digital first, they did the first hybrid of editorial and commercial within Condé Nast, which means that my editorial team also work um, on commercial, which is, I don't, I think it's going more that way in the whole business, but certainly three years ago and I took over, having such a united team hadn't been done before to the level that we do it. And it was interesting because it's always been church and state before. I mean, I, I've witnessed, you know, early on in my career, publishers coming in to see the editor saying, would, would you mind just including this product in, in, in the magazine? Because, you know, the, the advertiser wants to spend a lot of money and the editor's screaming and slamming the door in the publisher's face saying, how dare you tell me what I should be putting in, you know, in my magazine. And, you know, they really were separate. You never put in product because an advertiser was spending. But as print has gone into decline and, and publishers aren't making as much money from sales as they were previously, advertising has become more and more important and also new ways of monetization. So even if you have an unbelievably strong print brand, which a lot of people still do, thank goodness, there's still so many other ways around your digital by being a 360 brand, having print and a website and social media and events. There's so many other ways to monetize content around your brand that I think everybody now is looking into those ways. And certainly when I started at Glamour, it was completely new for us. We were looking at everything. We were looking at Facebook, we were looking at Instagram, we were looking at Snapchat, we were looking at everything thinking, how, how do we monetize these? But for me, it's also from a content perspective, I see myself as a journalist and an editor first and foremost, so it has to be authentic to me. And a couple of times we have slipped a bit too far in the other way and we've ended up taking commercial deals from people that I really haven't felt comfortable with at all. And it never ends well. You have to be authentic to your brand. You have to be authentic to, you know, we're about female empowerment. So now we have to always look at the brand and say, do they fit in with our pillars? Do they, do they reflect the values of our brand? That's number one. So that's how it works a lot of the way. Sometimes people have ideas to commercialize and I, I just go, I really don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think it's right for us. So there is still that kind of separation, but also what we end up doing a lot of the time is thinking of editorial ideas that we really want to do, but we might not have the budget to do it. So then we think, okay, if we really want to do this idea, this event or whatever it is, and we need to, if we get a sponsor, we can afford to do it. So we often think that way around. We think content first and then find a way to monetize it. And that might be an award ceremony. It might be a video series. Um, it might be an Instagram stories um, franchise. And we end up monetizing most of it. And it works really well because it means from an editorial perspective, we can afford to do what we want to do. And obviously from a commercial perspective, we've managed to turn glam around from when I took over, it was making a massive loss, a multi-million pound loss. And within three years, we've made it profitable. And we've done that by sponsoring as much of our content as possible, but with always with authenticity at the heart of it. So that, that's how we've done it. It's about heartening to hear, you know, you know there's, there's a very strong future i think for, for publishing but you know this kind of storytelling we're talking about you know for all of us yeah. you know, right and it really um, goes down to what we said earlier storytelling across all platforms you know you might have one idea for the website but we never just think of it so for example if you do a celebrity interview so th we had this conversation the other day you do one celebrity interview you might have them historically you just write a written piece we think okay we've got time with the celebrity can we interview it on zoom so we can film it so that creates a video 
can we record it so we turn it into a podcast? So before you know it, you've done one celebrity interview, you've got a written piece of, of content, you've got a Zoom video piece of content that you can put out on all your social channels, and you've also got a podcast that you can put out. So it's thinking 360 across everything you do and then thinking, okay, this type of podcast, can we, sponsor, can we get sponsorship for the podcast? Can we get sponsorship for the video series? And so it's just always thinking in a 360 way, how can you monetize the content that you do? Definitely, definitely. Oh, go Sorry, ahead. Chris, oh, okay. Oh, don't you just love the classic Zoom? You first. No, you first. Um, I just I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of Deborah because I thought that was such a fantastic point. I think when when you're approaching your content strategy, don't think of your social strategy afterwards. Think about it right from the beginning, right? It should be informing the story. Uh, and that is in a positive way because it, it'll shape how you put it together. It'll sh shape how you think it will perform in the future because when you put it out there, you'll know it'll have resonance. And it will give you, you know, again, you're all journalists, you don't have a lot of time and you'll probably, particularly if you're freelancers or if you're having to pitch different places, you might need it in different formats. So if you can go and say, I've got the whole package here, I've got, I've got recording for a podcast to, to Deborah's point, I've got pictures, I've got audio, I've got, you know, comments. I think that's really, really important. So thinking about your social strategy right from the start of content creation um, is a really smart way to go about things. And I think that's, that's shown in, in Deborah's approach to, to Glamour, absolutely. Sorry, Chris, I interrupted you, over to you. I, I, I was going to amplify uh, Deborah's point as well. Deborah, what a good point. Um, but just to see, I, we have to be very, very careful, but I am always of the opinion that um, digital activity that you do, if you're primarily a print brand, and even if you're pivoting hard, I think that the digital activity that you're doing, it is not absolutely necessary that it generates direct revenue, right? It, it, it's good if it can, if you can attract sponsors or otherwise monetize it, obviously you should do that. But there is value in audience acquisition, right? And there is value in uh, the same kind of brand building that we would tell our advertisers that they are doing by partnering with us. We can do ourselves through our own editorial voice, through a lot of digital channels that we have access to and um, Facebook, Insta, Twitter, all that sort of stuff. Podcasting is obviously part of it. It's a way of finding audience. We had a review in one of our, so we do a couple of football podcasts for like local teams here in Dundee. And we had a review on Apple Podcasts the other day from a guy who's a Dundee United fan in America, um, who loves our podcast and who's now, a re he said it was, a, it was such a good review, but it said in the review, I'm now a regular reader of The Courier because of the podcast. And it was just an example of that, oh, you know, it, that, in that particular case, that podcast isn't directly monetized, but it is doing a job for us in acquiring an audience and clutching an existing audience even more tightly to our bosom. So I think we, 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 we as long as we are conscious of why we're doing it and we have sign off for our publishers, it is okay for us to do digital activity that is not directly driven generating, so long as we're doing it to support other parts of the business that are revenue generating. Which is a lovely way of putting it, and we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Let's let's turn to a few of the, the questions which are, are sort of uh, piling up a little bit, and I'm going to um, just go back to the first one. We've got one from Lisa Granger. Um, if you are a print journalist with no experience at all of digital, where would you go to train and understand how to do it? Digital jobs these days require experience in digital, and if you don't have it, you feel a bit stuck. So I know um, Sarah's mentioned some of the amazing. Um, training abilities available at Facebook and Instagram. So, you know, there are an awful lot of um, free uh, courses available all over the place, really. I mean, you can get Google Analytics training um, available for free online. There's an awful lot of it out there. But I suppose, I, I don't know, Lisa, if you're on staff or, uh, or, or freelance or whatever, but I mean, certainly within um, most publishing companies, you know, I would just start badgering people a little bit, seeing if you can help out, you know, get writing for online if, if if you don't have that at your company if it's just in a strictly print role you know even even to the point of like you know blogging or you know writing for yourself or even you know having building up your own following on social media and contributing to the debate um you know i'd certainly recommend that well what about from other, other other people out there um deborah christopher so any ideas you know for how to get training if you're operating in that place where you don't feel you have it readily available at work I don't like giving the answer um, that you gave, Tim, which is do it yourself. I don't like giving that answer because it's quite a, an exclusionary elitist answer to give. It suggests that you've got the time and resources to do it. But it is unfortunately the answer I would give. And that's only because I don't know where, where those other resources uh, would be other than asking internally. But I would always suggest that, you know, if you've got an avowed interest in a particular thing, 
try and um, pursue that interest on your own. And it's especially to any journalists or journal younger in their career, I should say, journalists on the call. Those kind of things really help. And if I'm in a recruiting position um, and you have done, uh, blogging so it's such an archaic term these days, but if you've done blogging or you've got a, you know, a few hundred thousand followers on Insta or you've got your own podcast or whatever it is, I'll be interested in that in part because, you know, it shows me a, that you kind of, you've got that go-getting attitude and that you've experienced, you, you're, you're four pages ahead of where everybody else is in, in that particular manual because you've encountered the, the early doors problems and you've, you've solved your way through them. But also because quite frankly, and I suspect this is something that Deborah would, would echo as well, if you're coming into my organization with an audience, you're bringing an audience with you, however small that audience is, that's a value. And so once you start talking about your work stuff in there, you're exposing that audience, um, your own personal brand, if you like, you're exposing the audience out. So um, building those skills yourself through trial and error and personal projects is certainly how I've done it. I'm not suggesting I recommend it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, I think I was going to quickly add something, which, which is, uh, Lisa, I think, you know, some people have mentioned on the chat also that like NCTJ did some great courses. We've partnered them with a project, for example. Um, we do we do great courses. Lots of other you know platforms do great courses. But I think also get to know the ecosystem you're interested in, depending on what topics you're covering, or what if you have specialisms as a journalist, or if you're thinking of developing specialisms, get to know the ecosystems around those on social platforms and on digital. I think because that gives you a lot of kind of power internally, because you can say, look, I know who the players are. I've looked at them on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, etc. I know who they are. You may have even engaged with them, but you certainly know who they are and who to draw on. That can give you a really good kind of extra kind of foot in the door when it comes to showing your expertise in an area. So, you know, start thinking about like, you know, following certain niches and certain topics and things that interest you. And if you become an expert in those areas, that can certainly help you in your career moving forward because you become a go-to person very quickly within your organisation or within your, your own kind of ecosystem as well. Which um, I'm, I'm betraying my age now, but you know, back when I started out, you know, it was a question of like typing out letters and, and sending them off to you know editors saying, "Oh, you know, please give me advice," and and hardly any of them replied, uh, but one or two did. Got a hand, you know, sort of proper handwritten letter back. This is in the kind of 90s, I guess, um, and gave me really good advice. And nowadays, crikey, they're available at the at a direct message away. And you know, I, I don't get loads of them, but you know, every every month or so you know i get a few people approaching me saying oh how do i get into motoring journalism i want to write about cars you know and i'm always very happy to help personally because i remember what it was like when i was in their shoes and you know the kind people the few people but a few kind people who did bother replying and it was you know it's amazing people will want to help and advise so do reach out to people you know reach out to me or, or you know, any of the panelists you know contact us afterwards and i'll be very happy to talk to people um let's move on to some of the other questions quickly if we could oh deborah you got something going on very quickly, I mean, at Dharma, we actually train people on CMS because um, as an ex-print journalist, I know how difficult and challenging and the dark arts sometimes CMS feels like. And um, we bring, when people freelance for us regularly, we train them from the CMS because I want to help people upskill. And also it's helpful to us if we don't have to, to upload ourselves. So when people write regularly for us, we bring them in for a couple of training days, and we've trained up loads of experts and journalists on CMS, and I think it's a really useful skill to have. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you freelance regularly for people, maybe ask them, can I? Can you train me in your CMS? I'm happy to upload it. I'll reduce your workload. And I think most people are quite thankful for that. I would agree. I would agree. Let's let's try and crack through a few more questions. So we'll try and come. There's, there's quite a few piling up. We're going to go through them at some speed if we can. I think the data. So Martha asks, how do you find the data about your content? In other words, how do you evaluate it? Um, very quickly, just to you, Deborah. I guess you use it all. You, know, you must be glued to Google Analytics or whatever software you use for data uh, every day. What's the sort of quick, quick answer to that? I'm so sorry. Could you just repeat the first bit of the question? Sorry. Yes. Uh, how do you find the data about your content? How do you evaluate it? What, what makes successful content for you? Is it just page views, dwell time? What, what do you look for? Well, we have an SEO expert who every, we have a morning meeting every morning and the SEO, our SEO expert shares what our data has been from the day before, what people are searching for on Google that day. But also we, we work very instinctively on Glamour. Obviously we do our evergreen content, which is just things like 10 best mascaras. We're constantly updating that and looking to see if we've lost our rankings. So for example, if we're top three on Google and we've gone to number four, then we want to uprank back to number two or number one if we can. So um, I don't do that, the SEO person uh, goes into the back end, changes the keywords to try and uprank us. Um, but 
a lot of it's instinctive. You know, a lot of the stuff we've done, especially in pandemic, is us, is us talking and saying, I'm feeling anxious at the moment. You can be sure that if the whole team are feeling anxious, then the rest of the world is also feeling anxious. And really being instinctive about content, especially at the moment, because the usual evergreen SEO um, content plan isn't relevant in the same way as it was in normal life, because life has changed so much. So I'd say be instinctive, work with your SEO team. If you don't have SEO skills, upskill to understand SEO, also a social media manager, um, also looks at all the data behind the social media. She feeds back every day, Facebook is up 5%, it's up 10%. Um, we find there are rhythms throughout the year, but sometimes it's just that Facebook could change their algorithm, Sarah, and we can't work out why we're down or why we're up. And sometimes, you just can't work it out. There's no, there's no explanation. Um, we always try to get picked up by places like Flipboard or Google Discover because that, that you know, when, when we're picked up by different platforms, our, our traffic flies. Mm -hmm. So it's lots of different ways, basically, that we look at data and, and try and grow our traffic. I okay, think brilliant. I, I would just say quickly, quickly, um, you know, all social platforms have free forms of analytics. I mean, we obviously have Creative Studio, which is how you can track performance of all your Facebook pages. We have, I mentioned before, CrowdTangle, which you can also, um, you know, track performance and benchmark it against your competitors. It also helps you news gather. Um, you know, I, to Deborah's point on our algorithm, it's it does change, and we do, you know, as much as possible, um, make public when we do make changes. We also, you know, we are a huge ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, that also speaks to a, a good point that Deborah made, which is be aware of what is going on around social media platforms. We always post updates in our newsroom or on the Facebook Journalism Project website. Um, the other platforms do the same. So keeping up to date on what, they're, what we're doing and how we're thinking also in terms of what we're doing, I think is important for you in terms of being able to show internally that you are up to date on what things are doing, but also um, just for yourself, it helps keep you kind of mindful of like, you know, what kind of things are happening in the ecosystem. Yeah, brilliant. So we've got seven minutes left. I'm sure some of you, uh, uh, well, I know some of the panelists have got two o'clock meetings. I'm sure people, uh, some of our attendees as well. So we're gonna try and crack through as many questions as we can in the last few minutes. Um, there's a good one here from Stephen Lepetak, who asks, how do you encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, older members of your newsrooms to upskill for the good of a publication as well as their own careers. And I'm going to, Chris, I mean, I think you mentioned um, earlier on, but, you know, when it's the sense of ownership and getting people involved and giving people projects, whether it's, you know, looking, nurturing this TikTok audience or whatever, and you said it doesn't necessarily need to be the young ones. That's probably very true, isn't it? But do you have any sort of advice on that? Have you seen come across this in your career? I think there's two, form, two things there. One is, uh, you know, being positive and encouraging and you know cheerleading any pivot that um, some more experienced, uh, more heritage folks in a print organization might uh, do. So if they're, if they're making moves to something, encourage them, cheerlead them, applaud them. But then also I would say, I think, you know, if, if somebody doesn't want to make that pivot, it's going to be a very deep challenge. And I would, I, I'm not sure it's a good use of, of our time to uh, bash up against that brick wall. Yeah, anyone, I think anyone can do this, hopefully. hopefully. Go on, Sarah, you got something to say? I, I mean, you know, I, first of all, definition of old, I'm trying to think if I can put myself, do I put myself in that bracket? I, I hope not. Um, I'm but, a little grey beard, so I, I'm <laughs> But I think I think it's a good point. I, I I've worked in newsrooms for fifteen years, and I'm mindful that you know pivoting and retraining is hard. Um, you know, it's it, it just is. But I I think one thing I found is I did a lot of digital training when I was the social media editor at different organisations, and I think one way I put it was we are story. I mean, this all goes back to what Deborah and Chris and I have been talking about constantly, which is storytelling. And I found that if I said there is a whole welter of stories out there on these platforms, on the areas you are covering that you can tell. There are whole communities that you can tap into to help you tell incredibly powerful stories that will do well uh, within our magazines and on our own platforms, on these, on these on different platforms and through digital. You know, this is a great opportunity to tap into that. Think about that and think about how that could help you. And I, I wonder if maybe that's a way potentially to approach it. I found sometimes that did resonate with people who were a little resistant to change. I was like, you know, we, we go where the stories are, right? The stories are here. Uh, and that seemed to help people reframe it in terms of like, this is not just a case of trying to learn technical new platforms and technical skills. It's actually about going where the stories are. 
Mm -hmm. That's a nice, that's a nice point. We've got a question here from uh, Pandora Dutt, uh, who asks, with more user generated content and the presence of influencers, how can publishers who are either primarily print orientated or maybe new, how can they stand out from a crowd? I'm going to maybe ask Deborah to have a little consider of that one. Do you, because I guess, you know, in your space, there's a lot of, um, an awful lot in, in the sort of the women's and the lifestyle and sort of fashion world. There's a lot of uh, UGC and influencers out there. Do you try and work with them or how do you, how do you make glamour stand out and being better from some of those uh, sort of upstart rivals? I don't think it's about being better. I think it's about being different and having a USP. So for Glamour, I, th I think there's, you know, social media and digital, it's a massive universe and lots of different content creators working in different spaces. And I think there's, there's room for everybody to work alongside each other. I don't see them as competitive in that way. Um, I think journalism, journalists, have expertise. Um, most of us have trained, we've been doing this for years and years and years. It's not just from a passion, it's actually from training and learning and understanding, which is a plus point for journalists. I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of influencers who don't have that expertise and that authority. Um, I think that for Glamour, it was about finding USP and that's why we pivoted to Beauty First because Vogue owns the space in fashion and lots of other people own the space in different areas, but we didn't feel that anyone was owning the space in beauty online um, in the UK. They were in America, but not in the UK. So we, we found where there was a, a gap in the market and we've gone for it. And that's been huge success. That's, that's been a big part of the success. So find your USP. If you're a new, if you're a new brand or if you're trying to find your way, I think generalization is difficult for people. I think find what your speciality is and really make that your piece de resistance. Um, I think that work with influencers, they have amazing, um, they've got amazing reach. Why not use each other's reach? You can help them grow their following. They can help you grow your following. We do loads of work with influencers. Most of our um, Instagram stories, we, we invite influencers to do a story for us. So we do something called Wellness Wednesday, where we get influencers to come and share their wellness hacks on a Sunday, we do self care Sunday. We use influencers to do that again. It's a, you know it, it, it's a it's mutually beneficial to us all. So I don't think work against. I think work with them. Now we've got two minutes left. I'm going to try and we've only got a couple of questions we haven't tackled. So I'm going to go through really quickly. Maybe just pick on one of you. Um, Paul Coburn is a freelance magazine journalist um, and sort of comments about how actually the money for freelance commissions actually is still in print more than digital. Any thoughts on that, Chris? You've worked in print and across all you know sorts of different publishers. You know the money is still allegedly still in print more than in digital. And you know from a freelance perspective, what do you think about that? I think there's you know commission for commission. It's my experience that print certainly still pays more than uh, online does, but there are more commissions available in digital than there are in print. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good. At one fifty nine, with some of the panel having to go, I'm afraid there are only a couple of pictures we haven't. Uh, questions we haven't quite got round to but I'm gonna to have to sum up I'm afraid we will maybe try and answer those on our social channels instead but it just remains for me to give a huge thank you really to the panel I'm so so grateful uh, Deborah Joseph the editor-in-chief of Glamour UK Sarah Brown head of news partnerships at Facebook for Northern uh, Europe and Chris Finn who's head of podcast at DC Thompson uh, Media uh, they've been absolutely brilliant really enjoyed having you all on board I hope everyone's found it useful it remains for me just to sort of remind you all that there's a lot more BSME events coming up like this. Do sign up, have a look at the website, follow BSME on social. And specifically, there is the BSME Awards 2020 ceremony coming up on the 11th of February at 5 p.m., where we recognize the, the greatest work in the magazine space. So do please put that in your diary, come along. Uh, there's probably other things I've forgotten to remind you about, but do, do follow our channels, have a look, um, and we'll be rounding up this session. I think there'll be some takeouts, which we will uh, be sending out as well. But really, I hope you found it useful. And do approach um, me or, or us sort of separately if you've got any other follow-up questions. And um, I can just about say Happy New Year still, I think. So anyway, good to have you on board, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.